I was born in 1931, May 2nd, in Binghamton, New York, small city in mid-state New York. I had a brother. I was the oldest of uh, two of us. Uh, we lived in an Italian neighborhood. We were the only Irish family to live in an Italian neighborhood. So ethnically, maybe I, I'm Irish, but culturally, I'm almost a lot Italian. I just loved living there. Born in 31, kind of in the midst of the Depression when nobody had any money, but I remember nothing but good times, good friends. The Italians were so, the neighborhood was so great because when you were invited in, you couldn't leave until they stuffed you. And then you would move on from there. And after Binghamton, somewhere around eight years old or so, we moved to Baltimore, Maryland. My dad was looking for work. He was a plumber. His dad had a plumbing shop, in fact, the largest plumbing shop in uh, Binghamton at the time. My dad always said he traded. He wanted to be a pool player, but one day his dad said, well, you meet me on the job. And he said, I traded my pool cue for a shovel. So his, his uh, occupation became plumbing. Moved to Baltimore to find work, actually. Lived there for two or three years until the, the war started. And then he hitchhiked out here to California a couple of times to find work, work in the shipping industry, because that's the war had started and they, they needed people. And he was a, a pipe fitter. So he came home one day, packed us, got us all together, packed everything in a trunk or so, got on a train, and came here to California. And it was the happiest day of my life, even before I knew California. I still remember today coming into uh, Union Station, and what I, I mostly remember is the sunshine, the beautiful sunshine. I remember the tiles that were red and yellow, and I remember seeing the palm trees, being close to a palm tree for the very first time in my life. And it was wonderful. It was wonderful. In California, I knew right off the bat that California was my place, and this was where I was going to be happy and my life was going to work great. And it did. It did. We actually lived uh, down in L.A. at first, right downtown in L.A., the east side of L.A. actually, a place called Dogtown because they had a pound there. And I went from, uh, I used to go to Catholic school back uh, east uh, one day, when I was in Binghamton, I started in public school, but one day, apparently, the priest came to the door, and the next day I found myself in Catholic school. So I did that for the first six years of my life. Then we became there in California, living in Dogtown. I went to Central Junior High School, which is where the Board of Education is now. And Central was a very interesting place, filled with a lot of diversity. In fact, I learned diversity early in my life. It was great. It was great, because from Central Junior High School in about 1945, I went to Belmont High School, and it was one of the great experiences of my life. In Belmont, we had, because in our area, we had Chinatown, we had little Tokyo, we had a, a Latino population, we had everything there. So what California is kind of getting to be today is what I knew in high school, and it was great. I can remember going to when we'd go to a stage show in the school, when they'd have it, you'd see all these acts. You'd see these dancers, the Chinese doing their thing, all the different uh, groups, and, it, and it, was, uh, it was great for me. So diversity was never a problem for me because I lived up, lived in it all the time. Uh, after uh, Belmont, uh, I played football at Belmont. And actually, I have to admit, that I always had the idea that I would go to college, but I never really planned for it. I just had the idea. And uh, I took the appropriate courses and did okay with them. And then when my senior year happened, I played football and I made, I don't want to be bragging, but I made uh, all cities in football and had a nice year. And you know how life can go, for me at least. I consider myself lucky more than talented. Things just came al around at the right time for me, and I kind of, someone took me by the hand and took me somewhere and helped make things all right for me. I had no really pl 
plans on how I would get to college until a coach we had at our place took me by the hand, took me to Occidental College, where I took their test and passed it well enough, I, I guess. And uh, it had a lot to do with the, it wasn't a football scholarship, they, it was a small college, so they didn't have scholarships, but they had grant and aids and they had jobs you could do to kind of get through college. And, uh, and again, Occidental College was a big, big time, big moment in my life. It's where I met my wife. It's where I experienced, I got my degree. It's where I had fun and success in the chosen sport. It's where I learned my occupation. And, and, and I tell friends of mine that when I came there, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was the first one to ever graduate from college, in our family at least. And when I was uh, making out the the form for getting into college, I will always tell people I meant to become a physicist, but I accidentally hit physical education. So there you go. And it's been very good for me for my whole life. My job has been play for me for my whole life. You know, it's nothing better. I've always loved coming to school. I've always loved the people I've worked with. And, uh, and I looked forward to it. It was exactly what was good for me. Vince McCullough is an amazing human being. Uh, I met him as a 10th grader at Belmont High School, which is downtown LA. Uh, he was from Dogtown, and I was, that tells you what the area was like. Uh, he literally changed my life. He was the captain of the football team. He had the lead in the senior play. He was student body president. He's an amazing mind, an amazing person. Football wise, uh, he taught me more in the huddle than the coach taught us all week long. And I think we came in second in the league and it's the best Belmont had done in years. In fact, uh, in the Times, he got the LA Times High School Player of the Week, which had never happened at Belmont High School before. And uh, they were quoted as saying, Felix Panino was our coach. And I remember the Times writing, Felix Panino, Cinderella Sentinels. We were the Belmont Sentinels. But it was all Vince. Vince did it all. So actually, he taught me everything I knew about football. And it's all worked. He, he's practically a, a genius, <laughs> even though he doesn't pay much attention to it anymore. But... Uh, if it wasn't for Vince, I, I wouldn't be the director of football operations here at Saddleback College. I started Occidental in 1949 as, as a freshman and uh, played freshman football, got into my studies. And then somewhere around the sophomore year, the Korean conflict, we didn't call it war in those days, right? Conflict broke out and they were drafting. And they're drafting people actually out of college, too. So you never knew whether you might be drafted or you might not be drafted. So if I was going to be really honest with myself, at the same time, I was a little bored with college. I volunteered for the draft. So in about uh, 1951, in the beginning sophomore year, after I did the sophomore year, I went into the service. In the service, I eventually wound up going to Korea I was a rifleman in Korea, and uh, it taught me that war is not fun, and that uh, it's a horrible experience, and I was happy to get out of it. And uh, when I came back home, I, I really started uh, Occidental again. And at Oxy, in, in that time when I got back, is when I met my wife. I was, by the way, it's a corny 50 stories, ultimately. I was the quarterback and uh, she was the cheerleader. And that's kind of what we did in the 50s. In the 50s, the quarterback always got the cheerleader. When I started to Occidental College, Vince was already in Korea, and I didn't know a single thing about him. But the beginning of my sophomore year, he was on his way back to school. And all I heard from everybody is, oh, McCullough's coming back, McCullough's coming back. Oh, you have to meet Vince. Oh, you and Vince would be perfect. Well, I didn't care if I ever met him after all that fall de rah. Anyway, he got there and he was playing football and I was at rah-rah and he was the quarterback and oh my goodness, that story. 
Well, one day I was on the field I had been practicing and I lost a pearl ring that my dad had given me for my birthday. And I was just crying and crying, crawling on my hands and knees. And Vince walked up behind me and said, can I help you? Well, that's when we first met. He said, well, let me take you someplace so you'll feel better. And I thought, oh, that's a good line. Well, anyway, he took me to the Griffith Park Zoo. And that was our first time, our first date. And we kind of dated after that. When he was playing ball, I was cheerleading and everybody in the stands was yelling and hollering. And one time there was this guy that started hollering, 42, get back in the zoo, 42, you stink. And the guy kept it up and kept it up and kept it up. And I was going to look out for my sweetheart, so I reached up in the second row of the stands and grabbed the front of the guy's shirt, yanked him out of the stands, and he was a midget. Well, everybody just went berserk. And Vince said after the game, is this what I've got to look forward to the rest of our lives? Well, I didn't know it was going to be the rest of our lives, but I guess Vince had thought about it. And it did turn out to be the rest of our lives. So we went together all that year, and we got married that June after we'd been dating probably 10, 11 months. And the rest is history. I worked. He finished school. We had little kids, one after the other. He was gone all the time. He worked day and night like a good guy. And that's kind of the gist of it. He went to El Camino to coach after he coached at Redondo High School. He came to Saddleback to coach after he coached at El Camino, and so on and so forth. And I consider myself to be pretty lucky. I don't think about him in the context of yoga or Tai Chi or any of that. I just think of him as Vince, the coach, the daddy, and the soul guy. And everybody says, how have you guys made it for 59 years? I said, well, the biggest thing is he didn't leave when the kids were teenagers. So there you have it in a nutshell. Four children, plus one, we adopted one, and, uh, and had a very open, happy, happy uh, uh, family. And uh, so, after I graduated from college as a physical education major and a coach, uh, I was looking around for a job, and it just so happened that uh, my father-in-law was the head of the school board in Redondo Beach. And I'm sure he had nothing to do with me getting the job, but uh, suddenly I found myself at Redondo High School coaching and teaching. And obviously he had a little influence somewhere there. And in that Redondo High School, I spent about seven years there in 1955, coaching, teaching, teaching everything. In those days you taught everything. In those days, all the baby boomers were just behind us, so you had to have a credential that allowed you to be very flexible. So I would teach history, driver's ed, whatever they needed. Taught there about seven years and uh, became the head coach there for about four of those years. And then suddenly a job opened at El Camino College. And El Camino College, uh, which is in the same area, uh, the coach hired me. I became an assistant coach there, which was great, and spent seven years there at that uh, at El Camino, where we had great teams there. I always seemed to be able to, as an assistant, I was always lucky enough to be paired up with awful good head coaches that uh, made me look good. And uh, after seven years there, I moved to here out in Saddleback College, where I became a football coach and assistant coach there for a lot of years, for a lot of years. In fact, I never retired from teaching, really. I retired officially here about 14 years ago, but I'm still doing it. I'm still doing it. What I do, I love, and, uh, and I'm still doing it. In fact, the things that I, I probably like, and what I do do right now is I'm still teaching Tai Chi and uh, teaching yoga at, uh, at Saddleback. As, as a part-timer. And where else can you go? And I, I look, I said, where else could I possibly be where I go meet a whole group of wonderful people, and they are, 
I don't know how wonderful they are on the outside, but when they step in that room, they are wonderful people. They are my favorite people. And of course, go there and do a workout for me, work out with them, and get paid for it. Sounds pretty nice to me, and I love doing it. And that's what I'm doing right now, essentially, still teaching Tai Chi and teaching yoga. He's the best grandfather that anyone could ask for. He's always been there for me. He's always been really playful with me. And when I was little, I remember he used to take me down to the beach and we would walk in the sand and we would do Tai Chi together, even though I was little and I had no idea what I was doing. But he used to play with me all the time and we, he still plays with me, but he would get these knitting needles from my grandma and we would put pots and pans on our heads and we would sword fight and he would always let me win and pretend to fall. But I've just always loved everything about him and the way he's never afraid to make you smile by making a fool of himself or by making a joke and he's just the most wonderful grandfather and I'm so lucky to have him. Vince has been my spiritual mentor, a guiding light, a wise and compassionate role model, a loving and supportive friend, and a positive and inspirational influence on my life for the past 32 years. To me, Vince embodies a completely loving person and demonstrates all the time how to be in the world in a happy way, not just to survive, but to thrive. Vince has embraced me and his family and my family as his own without hesitation and conditions. I've immensely enjoyed his sense of humor, his playfulness, his devotion to his family, his kindness and joyful embrace of living, the twinkle of mischievousness, his groundedness, his teachings of the path of yoga and spirituality. He always has time for me and he has never judged me. Vince has a rare gift of making me and others feel special, precious, talented, and of value, and gives wholeheartedly his full attention whenever he is with me. Uh, while coaching football at Saddleback, of course you're a teacher, is what you are. You have to know that. The athletic is just part of your teaching duties. I taught health education, which I liked a lot, and I taught the recreation courses for recreation majors. Anyone that wanted to be a recreation major I had to take the courses as I taught them. And I even tell, and then later on I taught yoga and Tai Chi. I, st I tell my yoga classes, by the way, and they don't believe me, but it's true that I'm not particularly a yoga teacher. What I really am is a recreation director. And I remind them to take a look at the word. Take a look at the word recreation, what it really means to recreate. And that's essentially what we do in that class anyway, and that's essentially, hopefully, what we're doing in our whole life. And the way you recreate is you play. So we play. We play whenever we can. But I taught that, taught those courses, and then along the way, you know, other things come into your life. So I decided, got bored a little bit again on certain things. And I ran for the first school board in the Mission Viejo area, which included Mission Viejo, El Toro area in Laguna Hills. And it uh, was the very first board that was there. So essentially we were the only elected officials in a way in that area, which led into a lot of different things. But that was an experience that was kind of good, kind of bad. Uh, and one, I didn't realize, number one, the amount of time that it would take to do something like that. And so it interfered with my family a bit, I think. And I ran again, I don't know why, I ran again and luckily I lost. So that was very, that was good. That was a good thing for me and a good thing for our family, by the way. But you know, later on, somewhere around 1971, 72, when I was at Saddleback outside, I saw this kid with a long ponytail in Saddleback, by the way, a college, pretty conservative at that time. They're not, they were really kind of not going to allow much of the hippie thing that went on in other colleges. But I watched this kid, he had a, a long ponytail and he was doing all these moves, these exercise moves, and I kind of thought I knew what it was. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm doing yoga. I said, wow, show me a little bit. So he did, 
And then he asked the question, he says, why don't we have yoga classes at Saddleback? And I said, why don't we? So what I really did, after t talking to him, they went to the, the uh, head of our department and said, why don't we have yoga? The guy says, I don't know, why don't we? Number one, we don't, have any, we don't have anyone that will teach it. I said, I'll teach it. Hello, Vince. Um, we are limited for a short period of time to talk about you. I can talk about you for days nonstop because of your impact on my life. When I first met you, I was going through dead end jobs and desperation and where you were my guiding light without even knowing of it. And you have been my guiding light since then and without knowing maybe you pulled me out of darkness and brought me into light. And my life changed so much since I met you and today I live a beautiful life and I enjoy what I do just because of you and you're always in my heart and in my mind and I always turn to you and you'll be my guiding light till the end of my life. I love you and thank you so much for everything you have done for me. Vince, this is just a reminder of the impact that you've had on my life. It was at Borders Bookstore that I met Semra. Uh, she was looking for books for her qualification to become a yoga teacher. Yoga books happened to be next to the Zen section and there I was looking at a book. We met. We talked about her being qualified for a yoga teacher and I was interested in yoga. So we, she gave me your name. I was interested in Semra but I got your name not a phone number. And the following week, uh, I came to your yoga class. Afterwards, uh, we went out, had coffee, and it all began from there. I could never have realized where I would end up in life in Istanbul, Turkey, in a wellness center with ever teaching yoga. Um, it's been, life has been fantastic since uh, that first meeting, and you were part of it. I particularly enjoy the times that we get together the laughter, and it's always fun. Thanks. And in, in Orange, Southern Orange County in particular, there weren't a whole lot of orange or uh, yoga teachers at that time. So guess where I found my yoga teacher? In the Penny Saver. Jean Cotner in the, in the Penny Saver. So I went to her class. There was about eight women and me, and this is my very first yoga class now. Remember, I'm a football coach, right? We were short muscled, tight, we force, we work hard, and we don't do things easily. And all I remember from my first yoga class, and this holds me in good stead today when men come into my class at Saddleback, is pain and embarrassment. Pain and embarrassment. Here's these women doing these things so easily, and I'm competitive enough trying to keep up. And of course, in yoga, once you get competitive, you, you defeat the purpose. But I remember that still today, pain and embarrassment. And then I told uh, Jean, Jean, I want to teach, I have to teach yoga at the school. Can you do something for me? Fortunately, she didn't laugh. She said, sure. So I worked with her about two or three months and then started the classes at Saddleback College. And it was right timing, not my timing, but it was right timing. It became the most successful class at Saddleback in our division and probably still is today. And at the risk of sounding braggadocio about things, we were maybe the first community college to really get into a lot of yoga classes, a lot of them. And uh, we were way ahead of the game in a lot of different ways. And pretty soon I got other yoga teachers interested. And so we had a program right now with, who knows, maybe 10, 12 yoga classes or more. So that was my first foray into kind of something different. And, uh, and yoga for me, by the way, became, and, and I think this is true, that uh, you can't do anything well unless you really do it yourself, unless you've internalized it. You can't just read a book about it, listen to someone talk about it, and not live the life. And so for about at least five, six years there, I tried to really live the yoga life. 
I was lucky enough to get a couple of sabbaticals to go to India, and uh, which was a great experience, and go to different ashrams. Ashram is a place where the yogis live, they teach yoga, to find out what the, what the skinny was on yoga. It's not that, you know, I learned so much in India about yoga, but I did learn, though, you, you get the vibe. You stand on the soil of, what, of, of where it was created, and you feel that. And, and I probably learned more technical things here than there, but, but I got the feeling about what yoga was all about. And, and I do things a lot differently than most yoga teachers, I think. I mean, I think it's a, yoga is basically a self-exploration, and the teacher's job is just to kind of point things out. You know, move this way, say this, or think this, or try this. It's not that you're going to do much except kind of point things out, and that's, that's what I do. And I think everybody, and I, and I mean everybody, should be successful in yoga. And if they're not, it's the teacher's fault. Everybody su should be successful. I don't care who comes into my room. Remember, uh, a, a, the football coach or basketball coach's son came in. He was spastic. He was in a wheelchair. But he came into the yoga class, and he did yoga. And he'd make his noises and flop around the cage, but he did yoga, and he was part of the class. And that's the way it should be. And that's, that's how I approach, approach yoga. And uh, later on, though, you know, I, I noticed when I traveled, and I start traveling a lot, visiting different parts of the world, back to India a couple, three times, that yoga wasn't always practical when you traveled, which led me to the next thing that I'm passionate about is Tai Chi. I would love to thank for that uh, experience that has been going on for so many years. I have witnessed it with myself and with people around. The constant discovering of inner strength in whatever we do, if it is trying to be the best, if it is trying to uh, release whatever struggle we discover within ourselves, if it is yoga or Tai Chi, there has been always that underlying message of discover the inner strength. And he has been, or you, if I talk to Vince, you've been teaching it with love. Therefore, you have always smile when you, were, when you are guiding us to discover the inner strength. And it's beautiful, and it's real, and I want to thank you for it. Wow, Vince, <clears throat> uh, from my heart, I just have to say that uh, we love you. I remember about 12 years ago when I first met Vince uh, and started Tai Chi with Vince, um, you can feel the energy, the, uh, the softness, the way Vince taught uh, and, and presented us with the, the wonderful feeling of the Tai Chi and the yoga. Um, personally, it, it just, I adapted my entire life around um, the feeling of doing Tai Chi. Um, for those of you that uh, have experienced Vince at the beach and, and, and uh, doing Tai Chi with Vince, it was all about the presence, it was all about the balance, it was all about incorporating, incorporating that into the life uh, the life feeling of, of, of living with the experience. It wasn't just about you got to do the Tai Chi, you got to do the yoga. It was about the way Vince would do it. But Vince, we love you and uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna follow you um, till the very end. And um, what can I say? Uh, you know, love you. As I traveled and, and noticed that uh, Yoga wasn't always practical, but sometimes when you're traveling, you might be in Amsterdam, someplace in Europe. Uh, I watched Tai Chi. I watched people do Tai Chi. 
really it's pronounced Tai G. So next time you're at a cocktail party and you're interested in saying it correctly, you say Tai G. Tai Chi really isn't the term. But I got interested in it. And the uh, first thing I found here in Laguna Beach was this wonderful little place filled with a lot of diversity and a lot of different things going on. I found an, uh, a woman named Irene Hamlin who uh, taught Tai Chi here. I had taken, I had really kind of flirted with Tai Chi a couple of years before. And uh, I'll tell you this, so pay attention, you people that are going to try Tai Chi. I quit the first two or three times. You know, I was, and I would say to myself, well, I've got yoga, I'm into yoga, what do I need Tai Chi for? Mostly I quit because it was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. You know, it took a little more time and a little more thinking. But ev eventually I met this woman who was teaching right up here at the local park, only two or three people, and I learned Tai Chi from her, and she was great. She used to be a senior teacher from uh, Marshall Ho in, in somewhere in uh, Hawaii. And once I got into Tai Chi, right off the bat, I knew this is it for me. Because it, the thing that I love about Tai Chi is I love this, the fact that it comes from an art, martial art and that it always works with power. And what I mean by power, I don't mean force, I mean power. The idea that the body is designed to be powerful, and it should be powerful. We should walk powerfully, we should stand powerfully, we should do things powerfully. And, and, and Tai Chi has it. There's nothing you don't do in Tai Chi where there isn't this sense of power. And I think it attracts athletes, or attracts people that are physical, that, uh, that they find uh, the movements of Tai Chi reduces their stress, it makes them feel better, makes them feel better and, and actually uh, perform better. So I got into that and uh, I learned it from her first and then just like yoga, <laughs> when I did yoga by the way, I was very honest with the class. I had about three, two or three months of training and I, I said, okay class, we're going to learn this together. But with my background in physical education and kinesiology, it wasn't as difficult as I thought it was going to be. But the same with Tai Chi. I wasn't an, an expert in it, but that's okay. What I did is I simply pass on what I knew at that time and explain to them, this is where I am. Forget the word master. Forget that stuff, right? Master only means teacher anyway. And uh, I started the classes at, at Saddleback. And I found that, again, those classes became successful. People were ready for it. And so, Tai Chi is uh, one of the things I do today with yoga, and I've been in, in, in fact, we've taken a couple of trips. We've taken groups to China, to the Shaolin area where we practice Tai Chi. A lot of nice people, friends of mine that got together and did a, a sponsor through the school, got a, a little trip, and it was great. I first met Vince McCullough about 32 years ago in this very room. Uh, he was a yoga instructor here as well as a football coach. and was getting into Tai Chi at the time as well. He's a fantastic man. He, he gives us love and wisdom and kindness. He's turned countless people on to Eastern arts and yoga and health and just a feeling of goodness inside. It's, it's hard not to feel good around Vince. Vince is one of those kinds of people that just, just makes you feel good to be around him. Um, he's helped me become a better athlete, a better husband, a better father through things that I never really thought about. Um, his gentleness, his kindness has seeped over into my life. His, and he continues to inspire even today. And he will always inspire me and countless others he's come in contact with. I've been taking Vince's yoga classes for since 1989, so that's almost 25 years. And he's encouraged me, and I've gone on and become a professional. I've taken weekend courses with folks, uh, workshops. I see three different yoga teachers besides Vince each week. And I ask my wife, what, what does she notice? And both of us agree. I come back to Vince's class every time because he taps into something in me. And she says, you're just happy after Vince's classes. You just feel good about things. And uh, I study and figure, how in the world does he draw that out of people? And he knows ways to draw things out. So. Uh, I'm here this morning basically to 
be happy by this afternoon? I think most people, when they think about Vince, they want to talk about how awesome he is. And he is a really awesome guy. But what has been of the most value to me, shoot, I'm going to get choked up, is that Vincent is an awesome person magnet. He has drawn the most amazing people around him. And so through knowing him, I have come to know so many people that I would not have gotten an opportunity to know um, otherwise. And it's just been absolutely wonderful and, it's, and a great blessing in my life. So I learned the yang form, and uh, you know, Tai Chi is nice because you can still keep going deeper and deeper, but I wanted to look at other forms. So I happened to bump into Paul Lamb, who was really doing a, a seminar at Saddleback College that another, that another Tai Chi teacher brought him there. And I was really checking up on him, by the way. I'm very suspicious about people that come and say they're experts until you check them out, you don't know. So I went up there and listened to him a bit and said, this guy knows what he's doing. So I learned his form. His form was he was doing Tai Chi for arthritis. He's a very wise man, this Paul Lam. He's from Australia, uh, Tai Chi expert as well as an MD. And what he did was he took a short form, made it palatable for the average person that had problems with arthritis to do. Very wise. Because he introduced it to a whole uh, uh, segment of our population that would never, never get into it. So I got into it. And so, again, I took his seminars, went to his classes, and actually there was about four of us became the first, what they called, senior trainers, that we were able to train people in Tai Chi for arthritis. And that was a nice experience for me. And when I got into that, uh, of course, being curious, I decided to check the long form, the long soon form out so I got into that form, which was wonderful. So I still do those two along with others today. I do the soon form every morning and the long yang form, and I find it very satisfying. I just like the play of discovering within the, the, these forms what's going on. But I also do another form called the 42 or mixed form. And this came out of that we took a group from Saddleback to China. To Minchba, and went into the Shaolin area and learned their form of Tai Chi. And the form they were teaching us was the 42, which is a mixed form of all the forms, but it's very Shaolinish. If you've ever seen any of the movies on martial arts, you know what I'm talking about. It's like a snake in their body, the way they move. Everything's windy and powerful and, and very overt. You can see what they're doing. Anyway, we learned that form, the 42, and we played with it, struggled with it, all of us. And then we came back, and now that's another form I play with. That's my fun form, because it, it has all four forms in it, the sun, the chin, the yang, and, uh, and, 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 and one other, the wu form. And, uh, and I do that. And I, and I use these forms, all of them, and sometimes I'll teach myself to do them backwards, this Tai Chi is great for attention and memory. And it becomes, the Tai Chi becomes a really fertile field for discovery. I, I like to say it's my holy grail search. I just pretend that there's a perfect thing I can do within this Tai Chi thing. And I'm going to keep searching for it. Even though in the back of my head a little bit, there's that little voice that says, Come on now, you're kidding yourself. Well, maybe, but it doesn't make any difference. It's something that gets me up in the morning, that and coffee, by the way. Gets me up in the morning, I have my coffee, I go down and do Tai Chi, and after I do Tai Chi, I go to the Coyote Grill and have a greasy breakfast with a lot of good friends. And it's a pretty good morning, I'll tell you that. Vince, hi. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you for your teaching, your mentoring, and your friendship. I came into your realm in 2009 uh, after going through an, a, a very serious arthritic condition that left me uh, basically uh, with no flexibility or no strength. And after coming into Tai Chi, 
Uh, you help me understand the structural aspects of my body, the use of spiral energy, and basically being able to put all of that together and have a, a much better mind-body connection. The one thing that is ever present that you've taught me is your phrase, present moment, precious moment. And I want to thank you for that and for your friendship. Um, I have been, um, I've been a, a student of Vince and I find that Vince is important to me because he always gives me a positive feedback. Vince showed us to, um, as a group, that it's all right to make mistakes and learn to laugh at ourselves when we do. He just wants us to keep trying and be proud of it. He has provided us with videos to allow us to practice at home. Vince is very good at explaining the principles and purpose behind its move or form. He gives out so much energy and effort for everybody, using every means of material like skeleton and visual means to make us understand. He uses music to motivate us. Yes, Vince is not only important to me, but to all of us students. When I first met Vince two years ago, I was a very hard-headed young individual who loved Kung Fu. What Vince did for me was complete me. I was so young and he was so yin, completely there, always in the moment. And the one thing that always rings true in my heart is, is four words he always said to me, present moment, precious moment, focus and feel Jake and everything will come from there. That is why I love Vince. I met Vince a couple years ago through Tai Chi, and one thing I love about him is that he's just an inspiration to everyone, and his classes are accessible to everyone regardless of skill level and ability. I think he's just absolutely fantastic. He's, he makes it so much fun. So to Vince, I just want to say, I first met Vince seven years ago when I took a yoga class uh, at Saddleback College and almost from the very beginning he suggested that I try Tai Chi. I resisted for about a year or so but once I started it became my drug of choice and I've been practicing Tai Chi ever since. I find that Vince is always in the present moment when he instructs us on doing a move that we may have done a hundred times before, he lets us know that this, we should think about it as the first time we've ever done this movement in this particular way. Always giving us an opportunity to improve even by subtle amounts, things that we've done in the past so that we can continue to improve ourselves. He also is known to tell classes that they are his favorite class. And in fact, they are his favorite class because he's in the present moment. Uh, he loves people, he loves life, he's a good friend. Uh, and I look forward to practicing Tai Chi with him for a long, long time to come. One of the neatest things about Vince is that he appeals to everybody. His classes range from teens to grandparents and he relates to all of them. He's the quintessential athletics coach, martial artist, yoga master, or Zen master. He's right. wonderful. I walked into Vince's class about four years ago. I went for health reasons and I had no idea what Tai Chi was about. I saw him, he was talking to us and I looked at him and I looked at the look in his eyes and uh, I knew at that time that I was in the right place. Vince is balance. He can be very smart and profound at times, and at other times he can be a very simple guy, humble, but always very happy. And that is yin and yang. I wanna thank Vince for everything that he's done for us. Thank you, Vince. A grandfather's love. 
If only we could measure a grandfather's love, the power from each hug and kiss, what some only dream of. If only we knew how to match the strength or the size of the love in his heart or the kindness in his eyes. A grandfather's love can turn back the clock to memories of days on the beach where you'd walk. A grandfather's love is like no other wonder. It's as gentle as a breeze, but as present as thunder. A grandfather's love is in every little thing, in a silly expression, in a song that he'd sing. A grandfather's love is a timeless affection, an unbreakable bond, the most special connection. A grandfather's love always lingers behind, whether he's a million miles away or right by your side. A grandfather's love can change all that we know. They love us, they help us, they watch us as we grow. A grandfather's love is quite special indeed. A grandfather's love is all that we need.